still focused on tomorrow. Houston, Carolina, 3.30 kickoff. Our next guest will be uh, back here with me after the football game tomorrow. Myself and Eric Dunchy will be with you on the post-game show, taking your calls right after the game tomorrow. You watch the game, you listen to the game, then you come back uh, right here after the game tomorrow. And uh, you can chat with myself and Eric to your heart's uh, content. But right now we bring on our, our Friday guest. He is Eric Dungey. Eric, uh, welcome in. And, man, I'm looking forward to this game tomorrow. I don't know about you. It feels like it could be, you know, a high-scoring, uh, kind of fun back-and-forth kind of game tomorrow at Chapel Hill. I definitely think so, too. I mean, you got two um, really solid quarterbacks going at it. Schrader's been known to tear you apart with his feet. But I think if Syracuse is going to win, he's going to need to, you know, put up 300 plus passing yards here and going to need some help there on the receiving core. And whether it's Damian Alford or one of these younger guys that needs to step up and kind of take the uh, the weight off of Schrader's shoulders because he's been doing a lot for the first half of the season. But teams are starting to catch on and realize and if we stop six, we have a good chance of uh, winning this game here. So they're going to try to spy him again, lock him in the box, uh, hold the edges for those defensive ends. And it's just going to need to be somebody else to, to take that load off of them and um, make some plays downfield, whether it be LaQuinn Allen in the run game or, uh, like I said, David Alford or Donovan Brown um, in the passing game as well. Yeah, you know, Eric, we talked post game last week. There was some of those plays in the game, like the deep balls with the receivers and the routes and the, the passes going out of bounds. Like, is it as simple as just, all right, minor corrections on that, and uh, you, you can get Garrett in line for the type of game you're talking about tomorrow? Oh, definitely. Um, and it's it's not just on Schrader there, too. The balls were out of bounds, but at the same time, you're taught to throw the ball three to four yards over that outside shoulder for these receivers. And the receiver's job is to save you that yardage from the sideline. So if they're getting pushed wide by the defensive back, that's what the defensive backs are taught to do. Push them to the sideline, use that sideline as an extra defender. So it's that battle. It's the head-to-head. And um, it's the little small things that will go unnoticed, and it looks like a bad throw. But at the same time, the receiver's got to do his job to, to help the quarterback out, um, as opposed to you know putting a perfect ball there, whether it be on a back shoulder or really just on the money. Um, and Schrader's the only knock on him has been his inaccuracy with the deep ball. So these receivers got to help him out here um, going down the line just so they can get those big plays and those chunk plays to keep these drives going and really just not start, stop them. And, you know, see who runs 30, 40 yards downfield, incompletion, come back, and just really slows down um, an up-tempo offense. You know, I think about some of those plays too. Like, I guess right if Garrett threw the ball and – uh, what what you'd call like the right place, like if everything had worked out where you needed to throw the ball, like you're getting your passes intercepted, right? If you're not <laughs> leaving it with that gap between the defensive back. Yeah, and he's doing his job. He's got to take care of the ball, and you have shot plays drawn uh, drawn up, and you want to make sure that you can really stretch them vertical. But if if you're not feeling confident and comfortable to to put the ball there, and then your receiver's going to go up and grab it, um, then you don't want to risk a turnover. So again, it's it's either the receiver's ball or no ball, and a lot of the times if it's out of bounds like that, it could be that miraculous catch like we saw Alford make where they ruled it incomplete there but uh, I think after further review they would have um, reversed that but again you'd rather just you'd rather just have uh, you know three to four yards and make an easier catch and whether you're hydrate or they call it hydrant out of bounds where you're basically lifting your leg like a dog on the fire hydrant um, and then one leg <laughs> back behind you um, that's just stuck in my head there but that's that's a perfect catch there so uh, I'm excited to see if they make those adjustments, and I'm sure they were working on working on that in practice. Uh, whether Schrader was grabbing some guys after and just going through two or three deep balls each, you know, you don't want to get them tired, but at the same time, you want to get those game speed like reps. All right, hydrant out of bounds. I, I got to add that to my football uh, list of terminology. I, I've, ne- I've never, uh, I've never described it that way before, but it, you, you do have a point. And man, I still cannot believe they didn't stop uh, the play to to review that uh, that Alfred play uh, last week because uh, it did look like he dragged the foot. And it's six six. He can be really far out of bounds and still have a toe somewhere in the field to play. It, you know, as Eric Dungey's with us on Friday every week. Does Alfred have to be the guy now? You know. Gadsden's out. Uh, Jones is out, at least for a while, it sounds like. Does Damian have to, does he have to be the guy every game now for Syracuse's offense to, you know, be able to move the ball consistently? I, I do. I think he does. I mean, he's got the size, he's got the hands for it. Um, and it's his time now. I mean, it's, when some guy goes down, it's your time to step up. And I think he's got it in him and he's going to be more comfortable. And now that he knows he's the guy, he's going to start making those plays. But you got guys like Dan Bellari who, who really stepped up. And when his number was called, he did everything he needed. I mean, making great, great catches and also just the yards after the catch, which is impressive to see. And then you can put him back in there and a wildcat, you can throw with them. So it's, they got some tools and they got some weapons here 
Baker. And, and Babers, there's one thing about him. He's going to adjust and he's going to make a game plan um, to go forward and really be successful. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see Dan Valari utilize a little more often and also just to take some of that load off of Schrader. Um, you know, Schrader's taking some hits throughout the year and um, he's definitely banged up here. But Dan's a big and he's a quarterback. But I mean, he put on that weight, so he's now a tight end, but he's still got the mind of a quarterback. So I'm, I'm excited to see really if he progresses and if they utilize him more often, um, maybe some zone options with LeQuint or just even having uh, him and Schrader and LeQuint in the backfield. You know, there's a lot you can do and it's, it's fun. It's just, you, you got to make sure that you're uh, comfortable with the guy back there and you have confidence in him to make those plays. Now, Valari is a really interesting case here, Eric, because, you know, he's a guy that, you know, he transferred in from Michigan as a quarterback and then made the position change when it, it was clear, you know, he's marooned to like fifth on the depth chart or whatever that he wasn't going to uh, play. And he's added the weight in the whole thing that, D, but we know Dino, Dino needs to see it in a game before he starts expanding on it with somebody. I think it was two games ago, you know, he had, I, guess, I think it was the Army game, you know, Valari had like a couple little sideline catches, like, oh, that was interesting. And then he's getting more and more featured in the game plan next week. How long does it take Dino to really say, oh, okay, like, this guy's for real. Let's start building some of the game plan around him. I think two games. I think he's he's really proven himself, and now he's going to be a guy that hopefully will be starting in that lineup and um, really just getting some minutes, and not only minutes, but making some plays and um, helping this team progress down the field. So he's, uh, he's an interesting cat, like I said, and these guys are going to start to step up, and they have to. Somebody, Babers wants somebody to step up now that the two top receivers are down. And um, Alfred, obviously, is the guy that's been you know able to make these plays. But you just want that consistency. You know, it's um, occasionally good, not a or a, <laughs> consistently good, not occasionally great. And that's that's been instilled in me too. And that's what Babers looks for. You know, Don, Alfred makes those great plays, but it's the little things like dropping balls that you can't do. He'd rather be consistently good than occasionally great. Um, um, and you will be very successful in the Syracuse offense. Yeah, it's the consistency that's what moves the change. Like uh, the occasionally great will get you a touchdown, but every now and again you need a first down and, and just yeah. keep the keep the team on the field and keep it churning. As Eric Dungy is with us, as he is every Friday, and you know one of the big developing stories around this game here, Eric, as of the last twenty four hours or so, is uh, Tez Walker for North Carolina being declared immediately eligible for the uh, NCAA. This is a wild situation. I, I don't think there's anyone out there that doesn't that doesn't think Tez should have been playing all year. Like he should have been out there all year. Well. What is this like from a Syracuse perspective, though, that like this guy is being dropped from the sky into this game and there's no real way you could prepare for what he might be uh, putting out there this week? Yeah, it's like a supply drop essentially here. And you got, you know, I don't think anyone matches his speed on either side. And he's got fresh legs. He hasn't taken a hit yet. So the, the best thing Syracuse can do the second he gets that ball is just lay a good hit on him and remind him, all right, this is this is not practice. You know, we're not tagging off here. If you want to catch the ball, you're going to have to make, uh, make some tough catches. And, you know, we're going to be coming and you know hitting you hard so um it's it's a little nerve-wracking as a secondary for Syracuse and the front is really going to have to get some pressure on Drake May because if he's able to just sit back there um Tess Walker is going to get separation after two and a half three seconds so if you're able to you know limit the time Drake May has to sit back there then hopefully won't be hearing Tess Walker's name too much but um I definitely expect him to make one or two plays here and you know, when you have speed like that, it's uh, it's dangerous. <laughs> Yeah, he's really fast. He's he's really fast. He played for Sean Lewis at Kent State. He was really fast there, and he's uh, still really fast at Carolina. Well, what do you think it's going to be like for Tez tomorrow? Because, you know, in the lead-up to the season, I, I think we all just kept assuming, well, eventually they'll get around to their senses and declare him eligible. He was practicing with the team all through camp. They, they He was practicing as a starter all through out camp. I, you know, I don't know how much they've been utilizing him in practice since. Like, where are you at if you're a guy like that? That it, he got his work in with the starters, but I can't imagine that's been happening nearly as much, you know, recently here. Oh, it's and it's going to be different. I mean, practice speed versus game speed is two totally different things. So he's going to be a little rusty. He might drop a ball or two, but um, you just don't want him to get into rhythm. You want to throw him off as fast as you can because the second he gets some confidence and feels good and he's like, all right, this is what I've been missing, then you're in for a long night. So as long that's what I'm saying, the first time he catches the ball, you got to have four or five guys on him and make sure that you know that, all right, we're right, you're the guy, but we're going to be uh, locked in on you all day and try to, try to not let you make those big plays and, uh, you know, that's those can those can kill you the 20 plus um, explosive plays those can really kill you as a defense and really just momentum for a home team as well that's really trying to start the season off five and oh 
Yeah, and you know, Carolina's uh, they're in, they're in position to do some big things this year. Like you talk about ACC championship and stuff with a star quarterback. That's all still uh, in play. What, what do you make of Drake May from a quarterback perspective? Uh, this is a guy who, as we sit today, like he, he's going to be a top five pick, barring something weird. He's probably going to be the second quarterback off the board uh, coming up in April. How good is this guy at the college level? I mean, he's really good. He's uh, he's consistent. He's just getting better and better, and he's a gamer. Um, that's what you really look for, and he's able to really control the game. And um, no matter what the score is, you know, he can come back and make the plays when he needs to, makes all the throws, Then he's also able to utilize his feet, and, and he's just a smart runner as well. So he's really got the whole package, and, um, you know, I'm excited to see these two quarterbacks Go, uh, go do it all off. I know when, when I would be going against the quarterback that everybody was talking to, I wanted to make sure that I was doing everything I could um, to take the attention away from him. Be like, all right, well, he's, he's one guy, but, you know, we got heart and we got a, a lot of fiery passion over here, and we want to make sure that we're um, doing everything we can to put ourselves in the best position. At the end of the day, the most important thing is the W, and uh, whoever has more sc- points on that scoreboard when the buzzer goes off. So I think Schrader, he's got the leg up there as opposed to just being a straight gamer. Um, the guy can just – flat out ball when he needs to and um, hopefully he can stay healthy here and get some help on the other side whether it be receiving or LaQuint Allen and just that line can hold up but uh, this is going to be a good game and I expect it to be pretty high scoring as well yeah you gave us the real answer there too Eric like every quarterback while they're playing they always say hey we're not watching the other quarterback we got to play against the defense you gave us the real answer there yeah like you know right when you're going against the guy Garrett knows they're both Charlotte area guys like he knows the deal you, you know what's going on when you play a game like this um, yeah, I mean, I'm going against a guy like Lamar Jackson. Obviously, you're going to see him on the scoreboard when he's hurtling over one of your guys. It's uh, yeah. it's kind of hard to miss. Um, and it's fun. You know, you look back on it, and you're like, wow, I went against, you know, some of these greats that are still making plays here on Sunday. And it's fun. But as a competitor, you want to make sure that you're coming out on top. And um, you can kind of hold that uh, hold that to him. But um, obviously, Lamar's, <laughs> Lamar's doing pretty well right now. So. <laughs> Yeah, I, that was. Uh, I mean, poor Cordell Hudson. Somebody give Cordell a hug wherever he's at uh, in the in the world right now. Mm-hmm. That was. Uh, that that is still. I'll say this, Eric, about that game. That, that what Lamar did that day. That is the best individual uh, athletic performance I've ever seen. Like by by like a, a football player in person. I I've never seen anything like that in person before or, or since that day. He was special to watch. I mean, incredibly special to watch. Just what he was able to do. He just had a very strong arm, and then. I, I just don't think I've ever seen anyone quicker and faster um, and just have a better ability to run the ball and know where to go and make guys miss. It was just, it was like he was playing with Vaseline all over him. I mean, guys could not bring him down. It was, it was pretty, uh, pretty unique and special to watch. That that was a wild game that night because, I mean, you were making plays. He was, I mean, he's jumping over to, that was a crazy game. <laughs> that was a crazy, crazy game going back uh to what was that 2016 mm-hmm. in the dome and you know eric it goes back even farther than that syracuse is not one as a, a team it doesn't matter staff or coach or quarterback or whatever syracuse has not beaten a ranked team on the road since 2010 so like this means a lot tomorrow if the orange can get a win you talk historically how tough is this against a team like carolina against a ranked team to go in their place and actually come out of there with a win Well, it's tough, too, because um, I feel like with these teams in North Carolina, especially, they've gotten some hype in the past years. But when you have a team like Syracuse coming in, who's 4-1 and and is very successful, teams want to watch the other people as well. They don't want to watch, you know, you play against the the Akron or uh, these lower level schools, no offense to them, but they want to see good competition. Um, That's what they're paying for. And you know, they're going to get loud. You know that the, uh, the old juice will be flowing out there. So um, it's going to be a hostile environment regardless. And that's what makes it fun. A lot of the times playing on the road was one of the, one of the best things just because you could go in there and really take the life out of a stadium with a, with a big play, but it can go the other way as well. When momentum gets swinging toward the home team, it really gets swinging. So that's why you really want to make sure that you're disciplined. You're not not giving them the leg up in anything, not doing any false starts or these PIs or anything after the play where it can get the crowd into it or um, really just set you back. So I'm looking forward to seeing how Babers kind of um, address the situa- situation with Marlo Wax and some of these personal fouls that really just ended up to come back and bite us in the butt. But I'm, uh, I'm, I'm excited to see Marlo's kind of revenge game here and how he does, especially after that, that drops pick six that could have been huge. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure he's jumping at the bit to get out there uh, tomorrow. Man, I, I think it's going to be a fun game. I think it's going to be a fun game. Uh, we will, By the next time we talk, Eric, we shall know how fun it has been because you'll be with me uh, on post game tomorrow. Uh, enjoy the game, my man. We'll, we'll talk after tomorrow, okay? Sounds good. Have a good one.
<laughs> All right, Eric Dungy joining us every Friday at 5.15 here in the 315 and joining us every week on our post-game coverage after the game. He and I will be taking all your calls and breaking it all down uh, tomorrow after Syracuse and North Carolina kick it off at 3.30 down in Chapel Hill. With that, we shall take a break. We'll come back a little 4 one in the 315, get you ready for the NFL weekend. The Bills are abroad. The Giants stink and many, many other things about the NFL. We'll get into that next here on QSportsTalk.com and ESPN Radio.